And um, I would actually like to know a little bit um, what's the knowledge here in the room about lightning. So um, can you please give me a sign on, on who has heard of lightning before that panel and who is kind of familiar about what lightning is? Okay, that's kind of half of the room. Who of you has done a lightning transaction so far? That looks very, very good. I hope like uh, next week this would be like all hands up. And um, this is probably rather for the devs, but um, who is running their own lightning node? Oh, quite a few, quite a few. Okay, cool. So let's dive right into it. Um, we actually yesterday had a panel that was moderated by Anita Posh on the question of Bitcoin can be considered money. And we want to shed an emphasis here on doing a differentiation in the beginning uh, of, of the properties of Bitcoin, the properties of Lightning. And um, when it comes to money and the properties it has, like being a medium of ex it should fulfill, the media, uh, being a medium of exchange, being a store of value, and a unit of account. When we're purely looking at Bitcoin, regardless of Lightning, in what sense, Mike, what would you say Bitcoin falls short to fulfill all of those properties? So when you're thinking about uh, what problems Bitcoin is not solving as money, uh, my good friend Akeen Fernandez, better known as Beautyon, loves to debate people on whether Bitcoin is money, which is... Uh, an interesting question if you think about it. Is Bitcoin actually money? Um, well, his argument is, is that Bitcoin is a database. Um, it's not money. Uh, no Bitcoin is actually transferred from one person to another. Uh, it's merely kept in the database. So Bitcoin is more a simulation of money, right? in the same way that AI simulates a human being, right? But just because an AI can perfectly simulate a human being doesn't mean it gets the same rights as a human being. So with Bitcoin, you actually have to have an address, okay? And with money, as in the traditional way that you would hand someone money, um, you actually don't need um, an address. So um, I, I suppose that would be how it would fall short, right? Um, and it's a question of is it actually money or is it a database? Um, and you know, having to actually download a wallet and, um, and onboard um, is probably the biggest hurdle of where it would fall short, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. And um, so the question is, um, Jack Dorsey just now, he, he actually called this narrative of Bitcoin as digital gold even BS because it's not really solving a problem. And he was mentioning that his team, he, his and his team's focus is on building the infrastructure to make it possible to buy a coffee um, with Bitcoin. Carla, can, can you give us an overview of how the Lightning Network expands on what, bit, what you can do with Bitcoin and which properties it actually has and, and how this brings Bitcoin closer to serve as a global money? Um, sure. So I think that it's pretty apparent that the Bitcoin base layer offers the medium exchange property that we talk about with Bitcoin. So there is a, oh sorry, the uh, store of value property rather. I'm all about medium exchange because I'm a lightning person. Uh, but on the Bitcoin base chain, we know what the issuance of this money is going to be. We enforce through our global consensus that the money is only spent once, so it can't be double spent. And through that, we have a store of value, and we do have a currency in a way, but it's very limited in what it can process. And really what the Lightning Network offers is a scaling layer on top of the Bitcoin network. So it's still Bitcoin, there's no token, there's no extra thing. It's just a fancy way of using Bitcoin transactions to scale the amount of payments that we can make. 
And through Lightning, we are able to really use Bitcoin as a medium exchange. We can buy a cup of coffee. We can make incredibly small transactions that would never be economically feasible on the base layer. And I think that this is a really kind of solid engineering principle, if you think about it, that we want to grow this thing in layers. We want the secure base layer to be able to handle fin final settlement and large amounts of money and issuance. But it's really wasteful and unnecessary for us to broadcast on chain every single cup of coffee that is spent using Bitcoin. So with the Lightning Network combined with the secure settlement layer, we kind of have the store of value, which is expanded and extended by the Lightning Network, which offers us a medium of exchange. Mm -hmm. So you are talking about this layered structure of, of um um, of Bitcoin and um, I, I, I also want to remind us of the fact that our current financial system is also built in layers and we are often just not aware of this so we have central bank um, transactions then we have like the layer of commercial banks on top and then another layer which is payment service providers um, what we often stumble upon when people get into Bitcoin and they read in the mainstream media about it, we have these comparisons of Bitcoin can only do seven transactions per second, but like Visa is able to, to, to do 2,500 transactions per second. Is this a fair comparison, Carla? What would you say? And um, what are we looking at from a transactions throughput perspective when we're talking about lightning? Um, sure, people love this number. They love seven transactions a second. Uh, and I think there's a few things that are relevant to talk about. The first one is what you're making the comparison to. So if we're gonna compare the Bitcoin base chain to something in the legacy financial system, I think it's much more fair to compare it to SWIFT, which is the settlement layer used in traditional finance. And while this layer is like, capable of processing much more transactions in the Bitcoin network in a day, it does take one to four days for that settlement layer to process them. By contrast, the Bitcoin network can settle a transaction with finality in 30 minutes. Um, and another point in this argument that's often left out is the fact that a lot of effort and anguish has gone into making sure the base layer cannot actually process this many transactions to protect the decentralized nature of the network. We've got entire books written about this. It was a large debate in the Bitcoin community around 2016, 2017. Um, so let's be fair. Let's compare Lightning to Visa, which is payments to payments. Uh, so what can Visa do? Visa can make a payment from one KYC party to another KYC party. It charges a fee of between 1% and 5%, and it has a transaction minimum of about $5. It cannot make payments to people who live in countries that have been sanctioned by OFAC with the United States, even if they individually have done nothing wrong. And Visa maintains a log of every single payment that you've made, and while they say that they don't sell that information, the reality is, is that they could be compelled to hand it over at any time. Right? Let's look at Lightning. Lightning is a peer-to-peer -peer payments network. Anyone who has access to open source software in Bitcoin can run a Lightning node and participate in the Lightning network. They don't need to KYC. It has, at the moment, much lower fees than the Visa network, around 1% of transaction amount, although this will move with the free market. It has a sub-cent minimum payment amount, so you can send a quarter of a cent very easily over the Lightning network. Um, and privacy is a bit of a complex topic in Lightning, so I won't wave my hands and pretend it's perfectly private, but in the non-custodial Lightning case, you can make a payment in Lightning and you have near-perfect sender-side privacy, and we have some receiver-side changes that are coming in the protocol that will vastly improve privacy for recipients. So it's very different to Visa. The nature of the payment that we're making is quite different, uh, but we also have different types of network. The throughput of the Lightning network is limited by the capacity on the network, the speed of the bandwidth that nodes can communicate with, and the quality of hardware on the network. Compared to Visa, who have a large bank of centralized servers who need to be able to handle every single hit as they go through. Um, and while we're not at 2,500 payments yet, uh, I think a year ago, the team at BottlePay did some benchmarking on Lightning nodes. And an individual node can already make 51 transactions per second with absolutely no optimization. 
and we can get up to about 257 per second uh, with some you know, improvements to the way we run these, the software. Um, so one, we're dealing with a very fundamental different type of payment and actually offering a much broader coverage than Visa. And two, I think that as the network grows and matures and liquidity on the network expands, we're going to be able to get very close to that sort of theoretical limit that Visa can hit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the whole um, privacy topic is a is a whole topic in itself. Uh, we we always have to bear in mind what is what is the attack vector and whom do we want to be private against. Um, but Nicholas, um, so we we heard now we have Bitcoin, uh, we have the Lightning Network layer, and you're with your company Galoi. You are working on the on the application layer. I would say you are building the actual tools to be able to use to access and use the Lightning, do Lightning payments easily. Can you give us an overview of what made you like? start building Bitcoin Beach Wallet and how, who, is using, uh, who is using Bitcoin Beach Wallet these days and um, if, it's if it's only being used in Bitcoin Beach or are people like on a larger scale globally using this wallet and where you're heading? Yeah, kind of. yeah so the genesis of the Bitcoin Beach Wallet is me living in California in 2019, and I wanted to work on Bitcoin. I wanted to contribute what I can to the, to the Bitcoin network. And I was thinking, you know, maybe I should launch. Um, so I, I really wanted to work on Lightning. Uh, we are like three years ago, where there is basically no Lightning usage. And my thinking was maybe I could uh, try to launch a new bank in, in the US and try to see how Lightning can be helpful in the US. And I quickly realized that uh, no one, there is no, you know, as Jack said before, there is no payment issue. Uh, both Jacks actually said uh, before there is no payment issue in the US. Like everybody have a credit card or a debit card, and you can go to any merchant, you can pay online, like it, it, it just works. And so the, the benefits of Lightning Network within the United States is, is very limited. And most people uh, see Bitcoin as a store value, right? So it's an investment mechanism. So. If you want to build, a, three years ago, a company in, in, in the US for Bitcoin, it's more a brokerage account, like you, you allow people to invest Bitcoin. Uh, but for that, you don't necessarily need uh, Lightning. You can use on-chain, you, you basically build an exchange. And so I was thinking, I mean, there, there might be other places around the world that might need Lightning a lot more than in the United States. And this is where I, I start thinking about, okay, you know, I, I should find a project that needs that and I could, you know, work with, with a community and it will allow me to have user and experiment and see how we can scale this new lightning technology and show that actually you can pay a coffee with, with, with Bitcoin, right? it, it just works. And I heard about a podcast from Mike Peterson late 2019 and it was about this community in El Zonte that is now probably the world famous, at least in the Bitcoin community, the Bitcoin Beach uh, project. And I was thinking, um, maybe that's a good place to start, like because the system, the banking system in, in El Salvador is quite broken. Uh, very few people have bank accounts, so it means most people use cash. And there is also a lot of money coming from the US to El Salvador with high fees. And so Lightning is probably a, go a good solution there. Another interesting aspect uh, for El Salvador specifically is that they were using the US dollar. So the assumption was probably the government might not be against you know, an, another currency like Bitcoin because they already gave up their printing press 20 years ago. And you know, if their citizens use the US dollar, their citizens maybe are using Bitcoin. In both cases, they use not their own currency. And so, yeah, basically, I, I offer to develop a wallet and see where it goes. And it actually was very successful. Now, probably most people in the audience might know that El Salvador has adopting Bitcoin as legal tender about 15 months ago. So that was uh, pretty much the genesis about the Bitcoin Beach Wallet. Uh, I think your question is also about like how many people are using the wallet and is it in El Salvador or is it? Who, who is using it? What are the main use cases? Is it 
only inside Bitcoin Beach or uh, are El Salvadorians also doing remittance payments with it? Or actually I was out last week with Felix Weiss here in, um, in Accra and um, he um, proposed some locals we got to know to also use Bitcoin Beach Wallet um, because also you integrated like the stable set. Maybe give us an overview of, of who is used. What is the use case? Yeah, so uh, initially it was really focused on this small town uh, in El Zonte, the, the Bitcoin Beach uh, community. It's like a 2,000 people. Uh, so it's, it's a very small village. Uh, now there is like a, a lot of Bitcoiners going there to, uh, to, to discover you know, what is it to actually pay on the Bitcoin standard. Uh, but, but this is a very small community. Probably for the first year, the people using the wallet were, were really in this community. But after Bitcoin became legal tender in El Salvador, a lot more people around the country of El Salvador start using the wallet. And we start to understand, okay, what is the need for the Bitcoin in El Salvador? Uh, one of the first uh, things that uh, came as a, hey, like, lightning is great, uh, but we, you know, the reality is that our, our unit of account is dollar. What it means is maybe next week I have to pay for expenses for my business and those expenses are uh, denominated in, in dollar, right? Maybe I have hundred dollar to pay for coffee, you know, for my uh, restaurant. And the challenge if you start to receive payment over lightning is that, okay, now you have liability in one asset, uh, uh, liability in one currency, asset in another currency, and there is some currency mismatch. And it's almost like you, you, you may be gambling if you, your business or, uh, is, is relying on the on dollar. And, and right now in El Salvador, everybody uses the dollar as a unit of account. And so um, basically the feedback from almost everyone is that, okay, you know, Bitcoin is great, but you know, unfortunately maybe I cannot save right now. And I would like to use Bitcoin as a currency, not necessarily as a seven saving mechanism, right? So to come back to this analogy with the US, like in the US, everybody are thinking about Bitcoin as a saving mechanism, a tool against inflation. In El Salvador, it's more a currency, right? So, okay, I want to transact with it. Um, I, I think the, the demo that we see earlier today, like, you know, sending payment from the United States, we strike to, to Vietnam in Nigeria is an example of, of this, of using Bitcoin as a currency where actually the, the end user doesn't even see that, right? Um, all that to say that, yeah, the feedback was like, okay, we need dollar uh, or dollar equivalent. And so we spent the last year working on a project called StableSat. The idea of StableSat is that, okay, I can receive money over Lightning, but this money is instantly converted to a dollar asset, dollar denomination. And so when I'm not transacting over the Bitcoin network, I don't have the volatility of Bitcoin. And it's really, the, again, the idea of using Bitcoin as a, as a medium of exchange without being using Bitcoin uh, as, a, as a speculative asset. Um, so our, our users are 90 plus percent in El Salvador. We really focus on El Salvador currently, but we, we think there is a lot of uh, demand for like other countries to, to use uh, the, the, the Bitcoin Beach Wallet. And so it's, it's likely that, you know, we'll, like being here is a good example to say, okay, you know, some people reach out to me and say, hey, I would like to maybe use it, but actually it doesn't work for this reason of this reason. And so we will see how we can expand uh, in other country. But uh, something I want to mention also is that uh, what we are developing at Gallery is build on open source software. I think it's a key way to contribute to the Bitcoin space is develop uh, a technical stack that anyone else can use and develop their own wallet. And so over the year, more and more projects are starting to look into what we have been built and they are launching their own wallet, which is awesome to see. So there is a project in Costa Rica called Beacon Jungle that uh, launched about a, a year ago. There is multiple projects being launched currently. There is one in Chile called Satspay. I think there is one that might be in the audience or is here at the conference is building a wallet called Bitcoin Mountain in Cameroon. And there are other projects, like there are people coming to our, our, our uh, Mattermost channel, like it's, it's our internet Slack, if, if you want community Slack. And you know, people ask questions, they want to learn their own wallet. We don't even know where necessarily it will be, in what jurisdiction. Uh, but 
but I, I think the, the fact that our software is open source allow anyone around the world to say, if I want to launch a wallet in my community, I can fork it and I can change what I want to change. And in a matter of weeks, I can have my own wallet. And I think it's a very powerful tool to empower more community around the world to use Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. Just a very brief follow up. Um, what do people need to use uh, Bitcoin Beach Wallet? Do they need to KYC? And how um, can they recover their funds if they, for example, lose their phone? Yeah, it's, it, it's a good question. So uh, currently, there is a, you need to enter a phone number. Um, so the, the Bitcoin Beach Wallet is incorporated in El Salvador, it's being regulated in El Salvador. Um, the, the idea is that you can onboard with uh, a phone number. And, and for instance, the reason why it's, one of the reasons why it doesn't work in Africa is because uh, if you send uh, text in Africa, you need to use different uh, providers. And if you send text in, in El Salvador, so there is some optimization to do there. But uh, yeah, you, you need to provide this uh, phone number, which is a form of KYC effectively, because in, in most countries around the world, you need to, when you typically get a, a SIM card, you need to provide an ID. Mm. Um, and, and so this is how the, the if you want it, mm -hmm. KYC Lite form that is being done on, on the wallet currently. So you have this KYC Lite onboarding, but on the other hand, it's super, super seamless to just onboard with a phone number onto a like global payment um, network. I think, Carla, you, um, even though um, being in a rather privileged position or so, I think you also had issues with getting banked um in in um there was a story can you can you tell us about that and and what the banking status of of many people around the world actually is and which opportunities lightning brings for them in this uh, regard yeah, i think that's always an interesting question so this is the first time i've been lucky enough to attend a conference on the african continent a bitcoin conference but just like quick show of hands who has ever had a problem getting a bank account or making a payment with their card Okay. Not as many hands as I was expecting, but uh, I have a very short story, so I've enjoyed a position of privilege for a long period of my life. I've always had a bank account. I've never really considered it to be a problem. I've never thought, oh, I won't be able to pay for something with the money that I've worked to earn. Um, and I was very lucky to spend some time in the US in 2019. I was there legally. I was working on a visa that allowed me to be paid. But because I was there for a short period of time, I couldn't get a bank account. And it was a pretty, um, you know, interesting experience for me and really, you know, grounding to realize how much that can affect your day to day when you suddenly need to worry about carrying large sums of cash around. You need to every morning make sure you have enough money on you, but not too much that it's not safe to be carrying it around. You need to think about where you store that money because your landlord has access to your apartments. You can't really just stuff it in your sofa and hope for the best. Um, and this is something that Bitcoin and Lightning can help alleviate for so many different folks, like the people in El Salvador that Nicolas has spoken, to, spoken about. They were predominantly operating on cash before they were given access to this payment rails. And not only are you given access to this payment rails to make payments in your day-to-day -day life, but also immediately connected. I mean, Jack Malas was speaking about this this morning. But you're instantly connected to an open and global network where you're operating on the same standard as everyone else. And you have your financial access just expanded way beyond what you ever would be able to do with a local or uh, you know, a traditional banking setup. Mm -hmm. um, for me, it's very interesting actually to, um, I, it's my first time being here in Ghana and no matter whom I talk to, or pretty much no matter whom I talk to when I, when I go out and I, I tell them about Lightning, people get it very, very quickly here because the city, for example, already depreciated like 60% this year, and the the seamless and easy onboarding to to a global um, financial ecosystem is is very yeah is easily understandable for people here that don't have access to to um, to banking services. Mike, I think um, you and your wife, you also went around town and um, talked to locals and. So, as I said, I, I feel like here is very, very fertile grounds for Bitcoin adoption because people need it. What is your impression? What have you experienced the last couple of days? So, 
my wife and I, we like to adventure, and uh, we got into a taxi. I love it here, because 30 CDs, you can go wherever you want you know, for 30 CDs. And uh, the market, the famous market was closed, so this awesome t taxi driver brought us to another market. And uh, my wife was giving me the look, like, what are we doing here? Are we really going to get out of the car? We don't need to buy anything. But we did. Uh, and there was like a fight just up the road. And there was chickens running around. And it was a real uh, cool environment. And uh, we get out. And there were these three young, awesome entrepreneurs uh, who were really eager to show us their shops and um, brought us around. And this, this was an interesting area. Um, they had electricity, yet it wasn't on for anyone there. There, there was no electricity. This guy was showing us artwork uh, with a flashlight. Um, and it was amazing artwork, and we bought a bunch of it. I have no idea how we're going to get it back. But um, so it comes time to pay, right? And the guy next door, he's got all these musical instruments, which I love, these finger clickers and everything else. So we got a bunch of stuff from him, and then we got the art. And then this guy, we actually bought a chair. I have no idea how we're going to get that back. These African chairs, they like go together. It was so comfortable. It was like handmade. We were like, all right, so we got all these deals, right, from these people. They got no electricity. Now we got to pay. Now what? OK, this is like a cash only kind of deal here, right? I'm pretty sure wherever this market was, this is not, you know, this is not uh, and not in the not for tourists kind of guide. All right. This is not a lonely planet wherever we were with these young people. And uh, so cash is king, right? And I don't have that much possible cash because we bought like seven hundred dollars worth of stuff. And uh, I'm, I'm kind of over there um, trying to figure this out. And my wife had two um, of the people that we were purchasing from. And, you know, we mentioned, do you take Bitcoin? And no. And by the time that I was, like, talking with the art guy, she had two people that downloaded the Wallet of Satoshi app. <laughs> verified the email, went through, plugged in the words. It's backed up to your email. And, and, and like, went through the whole thing, like, very quickly. Like, I turned around and this dude's like, Mr. Mike, I got Bitcoin. I was like, wow, <laughs> what happened? And then, um, you know, uh, and the other one did, and she gave them each $5 worth of sats, and like they were super pumped. And then there was another one who was like, wait, you have Bitcoin? How'd you do that, right? And then the two dudes got the other dude set up on a wallet, and my wife wasn't even in the picture, right? And it just like started happening right there. Um, so it was really cool to like watch this, right? And they had smartphones, um, which was which was awesome as well. So then it comes time to pay. So what are we gonna do? Um, there was one dude in this group of like 35 or 50 shop area um, that had a credit card terminal. So they grabbed the one dude on the other side that had the terminal. And he came back and it was like, okay, well, we're going to do them separate and whatever. And then he was going to settle up with them and, and however that works, okay? So there was only one credit card terminal and they had to wait. And they, they now fully get why um, Bitcoin works, okay? They fully get why Bitcoin works. And the next time that someone comes up to them for the trinket and asks if they accept Bitcoin, um, it's going to be like a resounding, you know, yes. Um, and the other thing is when we were buying our phone cards, um, we had this experience where I was at the line and these people kept circumventing me with like this crumbled up 20 CDs bill. Like they've been doing this since cell phones were invented, like, like habit. Like the guy's up there, bam, the crumbled bill. He tops up his phone, he's back in the taxi, he's back out on the road, right? So you get in this place, like I've never really seen it like that. You know, this is, this is the absolute reality of how people are living day to day, right? And by the way, they, somebody should like disrupt that industry with Bitcoin because this guy doesn't need to like pull over and park and do what he's got to do and run up. Like there, there is an easier way to do that, right? But my biggest concern um, or my biggest excitement for, for Africa um, is those people that were selling that art, okay, how do they get Bitcoin? How do they get Bitcoin? You know, that is the big question. 
okay? And maybe they can download Bitnob, which by the way, I found out that if your region is set to America, because a lot of people here change their App Store region to America to access all these other kind of tools, they can't even download Bitnob, right? They have to change it back to this local region, download Bitnob, and then they can change it back to the US, right? So there's this little hurdle. I've tried to get five or six people that, that we've met, you know, download Bitnob, and it's, oh, it's not showing up in my App Store, right? But now I understand why, you know? So like, with those people in that village who are very entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial, if one of them uh, just had a way, okay, to to constantly sell people Bitcoin in that in that same way, okay, in that same way that they're used to, okay, as the top up of your mobile phone, okay, and and Jack Dorsey actually mentioned this company. Um, on the stage earlier as Teco, right? But if they could just have one vendor, okay? And I'm not talking about a, um, I'm not talking about a, a Bitcoin ATM or something, right? But a truly a way for the people to just go from one to the next, okay? And just, and just top up, right? Like you were topping up your mobile phone, just that easy. And that's kind of what I'm excited about. That was the big light bulb that went off when we were out with them. Uh, and uh, it was really cool, like, watching it happen, you know, um, with those people. Conversely, um, the juxtaposition of, of the wealth, you know, um, there was a big tree lighting ceremony here the other night. Uh, and you know, my wife got this look on her face like she was so upset. I'm like, what's the problem? And she's like, we're here with all these fancy uh, people and they're celebrating flipping the light switch to, to turn on the lights out here in the yard. We were in a place that dude, he had a flashlight, you know? And I just thought that that was cool. And if there's any entrepreneurial people here who want to maybe bring this technology to Africa, I'm also going to be giving out a ton of free sats later. So if you want some free Bitcoin or if you want to download a wallet or if you don't have one yet, just track me down and we'll, we'll get you going with this too. Um, you, you were just mentioning Wallet of Satoshi, so um, in, in the Bitcoin community there is sometimes, uh, there is some people that say we all need to self-custody. Uh, interestingly, I stumbled up on a tweet yesterday where someone uh, was um, kind of uh, having a negative stance on you, also mentioning Wallet of Satoshi and you were like, it's everyone's choice. So I would briefly like to hear your opinion on how self-custody could look like in the future. We just heard a keynote of Obi who was also saying, I see a maximum of five to 10% of the people self-custodying and also Nicola's view on that because your wallet also um, is a custodial wallet, why so? so well, you... just real quickly, like in that, in that environment, the, this was so easy. Okay, and God bless my wife, because she loves to just orange pill people, right? I wish I had that like passion, that shit stopped in 2013. But she's like, she's like ready to go. Can you imagine if we had to write down 24 words for these three people? Oh, get a pen, get a paper, it's 24 words. Listen, no, this is your mnemonic seed and whatever, and then he's got to keep this safe, right? And then he's got to worry about, you know, all of this with the seed. That is not like happy welcome to Bitcoin. Right, that is kind of maybe like the next step because you know these dudes are going on YouTube and they're down the rabbit hole now. Okay, so maybe that like develops in time, but I'm not one of these uh, people who are in the hardcore like you know you must self custody you know that whole deal. Right, in the case of El Salvador, I went twice. You know, Nicholas. Um, uh, does the adopting uh, Bitcoin conference out there, right? And watching from year one to year two. And the way that the country onboarded people, they can't. You're risking losing too much Bitcoin forever. People's comfort level has to get to that point. So I'm perfectly fine with it. I know a lot of people don't see that, but I could only imagine the complexity of trying to get somebody onboarded in that type of situation and then bringing a pen, paper, and 24 words into it. It's just, it's very cumbersome. Yeah, fair enough, Nicolas. Um, so the way we think about it, at least on, on the Bitcoin Beach Wallet side, is to offer like a progressive on-ramp. So, you know, currently we have this table set, which is a USD feature, and we have the, the Bitcoin Wallet. And we, we, we are working on, on redesign of the wallet uh, so that like you really start with dollar probably, and it will be your checking account. And so, you know, okay, it's interact with Lightning, but you can receive money um, 
over Lightning, it, it goes to USD. And then you have Bitcoin, it's your saving account. And probably initially your Bitcoin will be custodial. But we also want to have a third wallet, which will be a vault. And we want to integrate with uh, something like a seed signer, such that you know you, you progress him onboarding, start with, OK, maybe I, I start with dollar. So it will be a medium of exchange piece of, of Bitcoin over Lightning, like with something like StableSat. Then, you know, once I'm more comfortable with Lightning, I start doing a lot of transaction with it. Maybe I have some curiosity and I want to learn about the store value piece of Bitcoin. I can buy, buy Bitcoin. It, it will probably be, you know, in a custodial form in the beginning. And then maybe you reach a threshold and then, you know what, like, uh, it's maybe time for you to self-custody. And like the idea would be maybe to have partnership with local merchant in El Salvador. There is about 500 merchants that are on a map in El Salvador that use our wallet. Maybe they would be good, good candidate to sell a $20, $30 seed signer or a J, like a, a, another wallet that will integrate well with a smartphone. And you know, maybe when you have enough money in your, in your Bitcoin custodial wallet, then you could use a wallet to say, OK, no, I, I will take um, custody of my coin. And, we see that as an onboarding flow. I think we want to facilitate this, um, you know, progressive onboarding. Like it takes time. You know, it, it, even me, like it took me years to really like grasp. Okay, you know, like I, I really, um, you know, I, I start buying Bitcoin in exchange and I sit it here and eventually, yeah, you know, after some time, you have the hard wallet, maybe you have the multi sig, like, but it, it really takes time to graduate. But I think starting with a uh, easy. Onboarding is key, mm -hmm. and then you know, as you learn, you you can go to more self custody. You can understand privacy um, aspect of you know using on chain, using Lightning. But it it, it really takes years to get there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I'm with you on that. Um, yeah, I guess we're um, all very excited about about the opportunities Lightning can can actually bring. Um, I would like to hear from from all of you what what are the things that that currently excite you the most about um, a Lightning adoption and and maybe uh, Mike, you can start. Um, you were what I found interesting in your talk yesterday is that you were putting the emphasis not on startups that are from its core Bitcoin or Lightning startups, but also established companies that can integrate Bitcoin or rather Lightning into their existing business model. Can you give us an idea of, of what ideas come up in your mind in that regard? Well, I mean, it's, a, it's obviously a blue sky opportunity um, here in Africa, and there's so many cool things, right? Like shout out to Machankura, you know, and, and KG for uh, creating a way for people here to uh, inter interact uh, with Bitcoin using a feature phone. You know, we, we take this for, you know, we don't really consider in the U.S. how many people are actually living on a feature phone. Um, and, you know, the Africa USSD uh, technology, you know, being able to do things like that. So it's, it's creating those tools uh, in, this, in this environment for the people who need it the most. Like, I mean, like topping up your phone with the crumbled up bill. Uh, there's that, that, people should be buying Bitcoin that way, right? Everywhere. In the same way that you're topping up your mobile phone, people should be able to buy Bitcoin. So I'm really excited for that. Um, and I, I think it's just a matter of time before the merchant tools and, um, and everything catches up. But really, it's the builders here. You know, when the builders start to come out, they learn how to program. Uh, I mean, there's many resources uh, to get going. Um, and I think it's, it's the adoption. The gentleman yesterday with the, the, culinary, uh, the culinary work that he's doing with hospitality and hotels and, and that. Um, all, all of that. Mm -hmm. Carla, what, what would you say? What, what excites you the most when you're looking at Lightning Bitcoin adoption 
Uh, well, I think what excites me is something that's pretty boring. Uh, it's just the payments use case. I know it doesn't seem very exciting, but uh, Bernard said it better than me yesterday. We lose $5 billion a year to intra-African transfers and fees. Like, that seems like a pretty good place to start for me, and then we'll take it from there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, same answer. I think payment is a use case for everything. Mm -hmm. Okay, that um, was a great overview already. I think we have a couple of minutes left, and as uh, with the last keynotes, we didn't have the, the room for questions. I would like to open up uh, the space for some questions from the audience towards our panelists. So I'll just okay. try to make it quick. Um, the ecosystem here in Ghana, for example, is representative of the work that has been done in fintech, in smartphones, in you know, digital commerce, and so on. And I am a bit worried that in this gathering, we are not getting to connect. Like I, for example, I was head of sales and distribution for MTN for eight years. We moved the ecosystem from 200,000 monthly active to 11.7 .7 million. And of course, the float became 7% of national banking deposits. But I'm thinking that, you know, I spoke to him earlier. Uh, it's not really a question, just a comment that on the flanks of this event, we must connect quite quickly so that the African gatekeepers are also able to put in something into the networking. Okay. Thank you. I, I think for, with that question, I think you should pay attention to the next panel session, which is on Bitcoin payments and traditional payments. So we're able to link more on, on that. Um, second person. Um, I've been watching the growth of Lightning over the last few years, and it seems very encouraging. Things seem to be scaling very quickly, but I've seen some skepticism and debate about its ability to scale to, you know, to sort of global levels. And I'm keen to hear about your thoughts about its ability to scale. So please take note of that. He's curious about the ability of Lightning Network to scale. So that's the last person. Uh, let's answer maybe okay. Okay. answer this one. I think otherwise it gets. Yeah, I think that I can speak to that. I think the question of whether Lightning can scale to kind of a global level is, again, the question of scaling in layers, right? Lightning gets us some of the way, and there are some innovations in the protocol level that we can look at. Like one example that people bring up often is the idea of a multi-party channel, right? You could almost have a community all transacting within a single Lightning channel without having to scale out to the rest of the network. But I don't doubt that as demand grows and as we do sort of start to face down the technical challenge of bringing 8 billion people onto Bitcoin and Lightning, we will start to build scaling levels on top of Lightning itself. And that's what's really nice about having this modular system is that we can extend it as we need it rather than trying to push complexity down into the base layer or into the, even the layer of Lightning. I, I think Lightning already scales uh, a lot. The data is just not public. So you may look at how many Bitcoin there is locked in this Lightning channel for public channel or announced channel. And it's, you know, relative value maybe not that much, but when you operate a node, you actually understand that the velocity in channel is extremely high. It's maybe a hundred times the capacity of the channel, right? Maybe you have like a, a node with one Bitcoin, but you're actually moving hundred Bitcoin per month, if not more. And um, when you operate a Lightning node, you understand that it, it's already scaled very well today. Um, we see that you know, by operating a wallet in El Salvador, where there is a significant payment flow going from the wallet from the government, the Chivo wallet, and the wallet we operate, uh, the Bitcoin Beach wallet. It, it just works and it scales. It's just people don't know about it because maybe they don't operate a you know, high volume Lightning node. Hi, thanks for the panel. I was wondering if you could briefly talk about the strengths and struggles that come with having multiple implementations of Lightning on the developer side and maybe of having so many different choices for end user wallets on the user side. Um, thank you. Can you, I think the acoustic is not perfectly fine. I don't know how you felt, but I didn't understand the question. Okay. The question was about the strengths and struggles having multiple Lightning implementations on the developer side, and maybe on the user side, having so many choices for wallets uh, that can be mm. maybe a great asset, but also maybe confusion. Uh, sure, I can speak about the sort of protocol level. So 
We have a shared specification called the Bolts, which is a set of rules that all the nodes in the Lightning Network need to follow. Uh, and then those set of rules are implemented by four different implementations at the moment, major implementations. There are a few more in production as well. Uh, I think that that comes down to a coordination cost. So whenever we make a change to the Lightning Network protocol, we need to make sure that we get interoperability between uh, implementations and that can result in bugs. Uh, so I think that it does add some challenges, but it is also, you know, compared to Bitcoin, which has a single implementation. Uh, but I think where Lightning differs in this regard, and it is good to have different implementations, is that they allow you to focus on different things. Bitcoin base layer kind of has one use case, you want to receive blocks and validate transaction. Whereas in Lightning, we'll start to see all these different roles come out. There's the role of a mobile phone, there's a the role of a routing node, there's all these different roles and different pieces of software will be able to specialize in different areas of the Lightning network. Uh, so there is some cost, but I think there's also a lot of advantage to being able to specialize. Thank you and very much. The second part, I think, was about the choice of wallets, if that's an issue for the, for the users, if there is too many or too. Yeah, I can talk about it quickly. Um, Lightning is a network, and the more wallets there is, the better it is. We want, in every jurisdiction, having networks that maybe are connected to the local payment system so that we can off-ramp and on-ramp. And for that, we need like thousands of Lightning wallets in the world. Um, so I don't see that as a problem that there is many Lightning wallets. I think we should have 100 times more. And hopefully, we'll power some portion of it. But we need as much Lightning wallet as possible, I think. Um, it's also good for decentralization. We don't want to have five big banks like the fiat system. We probably want to have 1,000, 10,000, 100,000 wallets around the world that are small scale, that are processing payment for organization, for communities. So for me, the more wallets, the better. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. All right. Thank you very much. I'm a round of applause for them as I leave the stage, ladies and gentlemen. Thank <laughs> you.